Welcome back. In this video, we're going to do some binary analysis to begin understanding what dependencies our solution has so that we can reason about next steps and how we're going to upgrade it from .NET Framework to .NET 7. Now, in other videos in this series, you may have heard me talk about the Analyze Binaries feature of Upgrade Assistant. That feature is still available and you can use that to do this sort of binary analysis, but I've actually updated this video to instead use the .NET Upgrade Planner tool, which is a new experimental tool we have to do that same sort of analysis in a richer UI-driven way. So I want to show that off. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. The .NET Upgrade Planner tool is available on the APIs of .NET website. You can go out to apisof.net slash upgrade dash planner in order to download it. I do want to emphasize this is not an officially supported tool. This is very much experimental at this point. But the .NET team is still figuring out what the whole tooling story is going to look like for analysis of this sort. And so .NET Upgrade Planner is one of the experiments that I think really captures some of the features we're going for here. So as time goes on, it may be that this tool evolves. It may be that we take this same feature set, put it someplace else. Um, so understand that this tool specifically is still very much just uh, an experiment, but it does showcase the direction we're going with binary analysis, and it is already very useful, which is the reason that I'm showing it off. So let's go ahead and get started. In order to use .NET Upgrade Planner, uh, you can download it from this site, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to click Download. Um, uh, here's the button to download, and that'll take just a minute to download. My internet connection seems slow today, so I'll uh, pause the recording while that downloads. Okay, so the tool is downloaded. We're going to go ahead and open up that setup tool to install uh, the .NET Upgrade Planner. So all this starts, I'll explain a little bit about what this tool does. Uh, you give it the binary output of your build. So you get, oh, and in fact, it looks like the setup uh, just launches the tool as soon as it's done. So it's already running here. But what the tool does is it takes the binary output of your application and it scans the IL for all of the APIs that are used. It then looks specifically for calls to .NET Framework APIs and it highlights which of those APIs are available on .NET 7, which ones aren't, for different platforms as well because there are APIs that even though you can build against them will work maybe only on Windows but not on Linux or not in the browser. And so it highlights that information as well. And this is useful because it allows you to understand in your solution, which projects are going to upgrade easily, which ones maybe are going to have more of a challenge, and you can start thinking about how you're going to solve some of these problems. If you run the upgrade planner and it highlights, for example, that you're creating app domains, which is not supported, you can think about, okay, how do I want to approach that same problem in .NET 7? Maybe you decide to use assembly load context. Maybe you decide to use multiple processes, depending on the scenario. But that's the way that we want to, to think about this. Okay, so we're going to in Upgrade Planner now, here, I'll go ahead and maximize it. We're going to click Select Folder. And now we need to find our binary output for our solution. So here's um, here's the eShop sample that we're going to be upgrading. And I'm going to the bin folder where the binary output is. Um, I'll navigate to that folder. And I will click Select Folder. Uh, so at this point now, the uh, first time that you do this, the Upgrade Planner is going to download the API catalog that has a list of all .NET APIs and which um, platforms they're on and which they aren't, so we know which platforms are available on .NET Framework, which are available on .NET 7, .NET Standard, uh, on Windows, on Linux, and so on. So this takes just a minute to download, and then it will analyze our solution. And once this download's complete, you won't need to download it again uh, unless the catalog gets updated. Um, also, even though we opened a folder, we are able in the tool, and I'll show this, to save a project uh, file that sort of keeps all of the work state. Um, and so loading, a, selecting a folder or a file is just sort of what you would do initially to begin the analysis. Okay, now that the catalog's downloaded, the tool's going to look at the binaries, parse the IL, and understand which .NET APIs are being used. Okay, and so here we have the uh, main view of the .NET Upgrade Planner. On the left, it lists all of the assemblies 
in uh, that, that it analyzed. So these are all of the managed assemblies in that um, folder that I specified and subfolders. And you get a graphical view of those same assemblies down below here showing how they depend on one another. And they're a little bit color coded where you can see um, items that are gray uh, don't have uh, any issues moving up to .NET 7, ones that are yellow have some warnings, and red ones have errors because they're using missing APIs. Um, and as I, I click on these, you can see it selects the matching uh, assemblies in the graph below. Uh, you also, if you had a very large graph and you wanted to focus just on part of it, you could click on a particular um, binary, right, or sorry, double click, and it will zoom the graph to show just that assembly's uh, dependencies and parents, or you can just double click again to go back where you were. Um, and then if you look through this assembly view on the left, uh, you see the, the current framework, as well as what the tool knows about where you're trying to migrate to as far as desired framework and platform, and we can set those. I'll show that in a minute. Given that desired framework and platform, it then gives a portability score, which is the percentage of APIs that are called by this app that are available on the new platform and in the new framework. Um, the, the absolute number of issues that have turned up is shown in the final column. Now, I do want to emphasize that you shouldn't read too much into this score. Like if I sort this, you can see a bunch of these apps have 100%. If it says 100%, you can take something away from that. And that's that this binary is likely very easy to port to .NET 7 because none of the .NET framework APIs it depends on need to be changed. In cases where the number is less than 100%, though you really don't want to read too much into it because whether it's 90%, 80%, it doesn't mean that the 90% is necessarily easier to migrate. It just means that 10% of the .NET APIs used here are not available. Here, 19% uh, are unavailable. Up here, less than 1%. And if it happens that this 1% APIs that we're missing are not available and are crucial to sort of the workflow of this solution, then this might be a challenging migration. Whereas if this 16 or this 14% is sort of easy to work around or not central to what the binary is doing, then maybe this one isn't that hard. So you get a first approximation of difficulty from this number, but I really want to emphasize that it's, it's not enough just to look at this number. What you really want to look at is the issues that are listed over in the right-hand pane. Now, if you have used the uh, .NET uh, portability uh, API port tool, portability analyzer previously. These are gonna be the same sorts of issues, but in Upgrade Planner, they're bucketized according to their type. So we see we have a group of API, of, of assemblies that we're using code access security. Um, and you can see, okay, here's these three different, so rather than having three different reports for the fact that the .NET compiler platform assembly used these um, CAS related um, uh, APIs because they're using evidence. We just group these all together. And so you might just know that, okay, our tool is using code access security or our tool is using app domains and reason about that at a high level. If you do want to see more details, of course, you can dig in and you can see the specific APIs that are being used that you may need to deal with. Something else I noticed as I'm looking through this, a lot of these binaries are not code that I own. I don't own Microsoft Code DOM Providers .NET Compiler Platform. I don't you own Log4Net. And in fact, looking at this, you might come to the conclusion that Log4Net doesn't work on .NET 7, but that would be wrong. Log4Net works great on .NET 7. What this means is that the specific binary in the output um, folder for this solution, that particular binary won't work on .NET 7. But Log4Net has different binaries for different platforms. It has newer versions that support different frameworks. And so it's really not a very useful tool for looking at your, your NuGet dependencies because whether or not Log4Net works is going to depend more on the version of Log4Net I'm, I'm using. I need to go out to NuGet.org and look at Log4Net there. Upgrade Assistance Analyze Command can be better for this, not analyze binaries, just analyze. And we're gonna show in a different video how you can use that command. But what you really wanna look at with uh, the .NET Upgrade Planner is the dependencies of your own binaries. And so what I typically do here is I'll come in, sort these assemblies by name. I'm going to identify the ones that I own. In this case, there are only three binaries that come from the source code I own, eShop Legacy Common, Utilities, and MVC. Everything else I'm gonna select, I'm gonna say remove. 
because we don't need to analyze whether Log4Net uses .NET 7 compatible APIs or whether um, you know the Microsoft AI Agent Intercept binary. These things will analyze at the package level. Is there a version of this package or of this of this uh, assembly that's going to work on .NET 7. The, the specific binaries are, are not interesting. So I remove all of those. Now this gets a lot simpler. Now we've got just these five categories of issues, one of which is sort of a catch-all, this API not available. But we have that remoting is not available. We have some binary formatter stuff. And of course, we have system web because these are ASP.NET apps. And so it's a known issue that all of system.web does not work out of the box on .NET 7. And so we're going to have to rewrite both eShop Legacy MVC and eShop Legacy Utilities to use ASP.NET Core instead. Uh, we can see that eShop Legacy Common doesn't have that problem. That's going to make it easier to migrate. So that's going to be one we maybe want to start with. I do want to point out as we look through these that there are uh, some situations where this is this is not available on all platforms. Well, I'm going to br bring this up here. It says that app uh, configuration manager app settings is not available in the browser. So if I was taking the eShop legacy MVC code, migrating it to Blazor or something like that, where we're going to need to run. Uh, in the browser using WebAssembly, then this would be a problem. But that's not our target platform. We're going to run on Linux or Windows, perhaps, on ASP.NET Core on the server side. So what we can do here is instead of having desired platform be any, I'm going to select all of these. You also could do it by clicking down here and right clicking. But you can multi-select in the top left. So I'm going to do that. Right click, set desired platform. Instead of any, we're going to specifically say we want to go to uh, Linux and Windows because those are the two platforms I'm considering hosting this on after I migrate to ASP.NET Core. Now we have less issues. We've only got four top level uh, categories of issues. Uh, if we didn't want to migrate to .NET 7, let's say for the common library, I want to be able to share this between my old uh, .NET Framework apps and my new one. Maybe we don't want to go to .NET 7. Maybe we want to go to .NET Standard 2.0 you can make those sorts of decisions, set the desired frameworks and platforms here, and you'll narrow down into just the issues that matter for the frameworks and platforms where you're actually going to be running. So now I'm able to see we really have uh, only a few issues. Uh, there's some sort of, uh, it was unable to find Log4Net. Again, I'm not worried about that because we know that Log4Net works, we can find it. We know that these two projects, the MVC and the utilities projects, have dependencies on ASP.NET APIs. They're going to be need, they're going to need to be updated in non-trivial ways to ASP.NET Core, but that is a possible thing. So I, so I make a mental note here. Okay, these two projects are gonna be a little bit more work, but they are migratable. And then finally, we have this unsafe deserialize API that's used in eShopLegacy.com. And this is kind of miscategorized into remoting. This isn't necessarily remoting related. This is just a missing API. But now I would think, okay, um, binary formatter unsafe deserialize isn't available. I would go out, I'd search on the internet. I would find out very quickly from docs that you can use binary formatter dot deserialize as a, an alternative to unsafe deserialize, which has identical behavior on .NET 7. And so I have a path forward here. I know I'm going to have to make some small, very easy changes to eShop Legacy Common, and then that one should work. And so I'm feeling very good about this eShop Legacy Common being a simple migration. And I understand that eShop Legacy MVC and eShop Legacy Utilities are going to take some work because of their web dependencies, but at least I know what I'm getting myself into, and I have a path forward. Okay, so that's kind of how you use this tool. Now, let's say you want to share what you've done with someone else. Two options. First, you can save a project so that I could come back and open up a .NET Upgrade Planner project, and it would have all of this information along with the way that I've filtered, the way that I've chosen desired frameworks and platforms. That would all be preserved in the project file, so I could pick back up this analysis where I left off if I had a very large um, you know, solution, for example, with dozens of projects, and I needed to look at it um, you know, over time. Another super useful feature is the ability to save a report. When I click save report, this is going to generate uh, an Excel spreadsheet that exports all of this information. So I'm going to, uh, let's call this analysis.xlsx in my temp folder here on the C drive. So now, um, 
if we open up that Excel spreadsheet, here's what we see. We're going to see only the assemblies, which I've selected, which is great because we get rid of the noise of all of those NuGet packages that we're going to upgrade at the package level. Uh, we have the score here. We have here uh, what I selected as desired platforms, framework, and so on. And so that's all summarized here. And then you can go over to used APIs to see the specific APIs that were flagged as being potentially interesting. Or sorry, not used APIs. Used APIs shows all of the APIs. You go to problems to get sort of the equivalent view of what showed up in this window over here. So in the problems uh, tab of my spreadsheet, I see here, um, maybe we want to filter by just eShop Legacy Common. It's just that single uh, binary formatter unsafe deserialize uh, method that's being used that has to change. If instead of looking at eShop Legacy Common, we look at eShop Legacy MVC, there's going to be more because it's all of these ASP.NET system.web APIs that um, we need to replace. So all the usage of HTTP context.current or dot session, HTTP request uh, dot raw URL. All of these things are, are, are missing and we're going to have to instead use the, the equivalent ASP.NET Core APIs. This view in the spreadsheet is very easy to save, share with other folks. It's an editable spreadsheet, so you can add notes in a new column if you need to as you're sort of going through these saying, okay, what's our plan for this API? I will often do this with customers where I'll have them share this spreadsheet with me and then we'll go through, and just add a new column for notes and go through and say, okay, for these types of APIs, our strategy is X. For these ones, our strategy is Y. And in this way, we're able to plan out the migration. We do also have the used APIs, it just shows the complete list, not typically that useful. And we have dependencies, which shows all of the binaries that these different um, um, DLLs that I chose are depending on so that we can reason about that, that graph structure. Again, I don't spend a lot of time on this page. The majority of your time in the spreadsheet will be spent on the problems sheet and a little bit probably in assemblies. One other thing I do like to show when I show off this tool is that you can create an offline version of it. Because remember, when I started the tool up, it needed to hit the internet to download the latest version of the API catalog. Let's suppose you are, need to run this on a machine that's maybe not able to access the internet um, in an unrestricted way. It has to go through firewalls, or you want to make extra sure that nothing leaves your network. Uh, in order to do that, you can go into Tools and click Create Offline Copy. And what that does is it creates for you a local uh, XCopy deployable version of the .NET Upgrade Planner tool that has the catalog bundled with it and that can work completely disconnected from the internet. Um, also in this by, uh, menu is where you can choose whether or not you're going to share anonymized API usage with Microsoft. Um, if this is checked, it sends only .NET APIs, not your own APIs, but only the names of .NET APIs that you're using in an anonymized way, so we don't know who's using them, up to Microsoft for telemetry purposes. It's really useful feedback for us as we make decisions going forward about which APIs we're going to bring to .NET 7, which ones maybe are less important. Um, so we appreciate it if you leave that checked. If you uncheck it, that's fine. Tool still works, same as before. Um, no, no harm done there. But let, let me just briefely click Create Offline Copy, um, unless you choose a location for a zip file. And then it needs to download that catalog again. Once it finishes downloading the catalog, we'll have a zip file that we can move to a new machine, unzip that uh, archive, and you're ready to go uh, using that. Um, I'll wait just a moment for this to download and I'll show you what that zip file looks like. Okay, uh, now that uh, creating the offline copy is done, we come back to the tool here. Uh, but if we go to that folder where we created it, I'll show you what we got. Let's see, just navigate over there. Uh, so now in addition to that Excel spreadsheet that we exported, we also have this zip file. Uh, and inside of here, you can see we've got all of the files necessary to run the upgrade planner. Uh, importantly, we have the catalog.dat file, which is where we actually have all of that catalog information. So we're able to unzip this on some other machine, run the net upgrade planner.exe app, and it will launch completely offline. So um, 
next steps are now we're going to do some analysis of sort of the source code and the NuGet dependencies with Upgrade uh, Assistant, and then we're going to jump into the actual upgrade itself. But at this point, you should be able to use the .NET Upgrade Planner to get a good start understanding what dependencies your app has, and you can start planning how you're going to move forward and reasoning about what the upgrade is going to look like in your particular scenario. See you back for the next video.